Hi and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about the glass transition temperature. Specifically, I want to show that the glass transition temperature is just not a value for a polymer. It, it's something that depends on the loading rate of the material as well. So how do I show this? Well, I'm going to start by looking at the, some stress relaxation data. So here is some stress relaxation data that I have for the rubber that was tested at uh, 21 different temperatures and we measured it was measured the stress relaxation response for this material. We see that the stress relaxation response changes very significantly in the temperature and it's a pretty substantial relaxation at each temperature as well. To create a master curve from this data, I will combine these 25 different experiments into one file and I will then use that file. Here is the master file that contains information at each temperature, one after another in the file. And this is the format that M Calibration likes the DMA data to be in, that you have all the data in one file for it to calibrate a master curve. So it's going to open M Calibration. I'm going to read in this master file here. I'm going to specify column one is time, column two is engineering stress, and column three is temperature. Then what I can do is I can simply use create a master curve uh, using this feature in M calibration. Then I'm going to accept the default settings here and that you see the figure to the right just now the stress relaxation response for a very a long range of times. So it horizontally shifts these curves in order to match the data in the best way using WLF shifting. And so this is my master curve that I will use. Before I start a calibration using this data, I'm going to make the time column start from zero, because that's what stress relaxation experiments should do when you use them in M calibration. So I'm going to create a load case from this. I'm just going to call it uh, all stress relaxation data. The relaxation strain in this case was 1%, so this is correct. But the time to reach the relaxation strain is now a little bit different because we have a master curve that was generated using shifting. So this should be a value that's smaller than any of the uh, data points in the master curve. So I'm going to make it 1e minus 7. And here's uh, the data now, stress versus time. To make this more easy to look at, I'm going to make the log scale on the x-axis. And in fact, I'm going to make log scale for stress too. Uh, of course, the stress is also changing many orders of magnitude during this experiment. So here's the master curve relaxation response. Uh, the next step is to se select and calibrate a linear viscoelastic material model to this. In this case, I'll use the ANSYS linear elastic viscoelastic model. Uh, we are covering 15 orders of magnitude of time, so I'm going to use 15 Prony series terms. And I'm going to activate the WLF equation for time temperature superposition. Before we run the calibration, I'm going to adjust some of these settings, these parameters here, so that it's easier to calibrate. I will specifically make uh, the shear and the volumetric relaxation to be equal. And um, I will make the total relaxation to be almost complete because that's how much the stress relaxes for this material over this time range. The next thing I'll do is I will tweak the time values a little bit better, so they match the experimental master curve a little bit better. And um, I will then, after that, specify the WLF parameters, which we have already determined when we created the master curve. So we can just enter them here. We don't need to search for them, but we need to enter them. And this is um, in centigrade, so the lower bound should not be zero. So this, in fact, I want it to be negative for this material. And those are uh, that. And uh, I think that's pretty much all we need to do here. I'm going to run this once to see what it looks like. It looks pretty reasonable. We haven't calibrated this, obviously. So I'm going to start running the calibration. And I'm going to stop it here. I think if we run it a little longer, it will smooth this out even, even more. But it's good enough for what we're trying to do here. So here's the master curve linear viscoelastic material model that we have calibrated. The next step is now to define a virtual DMA data so we can explore the 
the temperature response of this material. So I'm going to create some virtual DMA data files here using the edit data tool in M calibration. I'm going to uh, define 100 rows. I'm going to have six columns uh, for this DMA virtual test. So I'm going to set the column names first. I'm going to make the mean strain zero. I want a strain amplitude of 0 0.01. I want the frequency to be 0 0.01. Storage and loss modulus, we can leave zero. That doesn't matter because we're not going to calibrate to this data. Minus 90 to minus 40. Frequency this. It looks pretty good. I'm going to then create a load case based on this. I'm going to say it's in Hertz. And uh, this def default settings are OK. I'm going to switch the graph now so it plots um, DMA data in a better way for us. We want the x-axis to be temperature, the y-axis storage modulus. And if you run this one time, we get something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, the real tan delta, uh, the, uh, the real glass transition temperature is over here. Uh, this little peak here is due to a, the way we calibrated it. If we run it a little longer, this peak will go away. So this is the, the response. The, in the loss modulus gives us the, the glass transition temperature at this uh, frequency. So this one was a frequency of 0 0.01. I'm going to create a copy of this that is uh, four orders of magnitude faster. So let's take this one. I'm going to duplicate this load case. I'm going to say I want this to be 10 and save it. And then I'm going to edit the data for this. And the frequency here should be, say, 100. And the rest we can keep the same. Save that as a low case. Let me run it one time. Then I'm going to uh, edit these so they have different colors, color code based on load case index. And here we go. We can see now that at the higher frequency, the glass transition temperature is substantially higher. So if we plot on this curve here, the peak here is around here, and the peak in this one is approximately here. So the, um, the, gla the glass transition temperature increased by about 10 degrees uh, Celsius as we increased, changed the, the frequency in this case. So this is something we could do simply because we have a calibrated um, linear viscoelastic material model with WLF parameters. So what I showed here is that you actually should not expect the glass transition temperature to be a constant value for a given polymer. It will depend on the loading uh, rate as well. And if you have a linear viscoelastic material model with, with the Prony series to it and a WLF equation with that, you can uh, explore how the glass transition temperature will depend on whatever loading rate, etc., that you're interested in. If you have any questions on this, you can ask them below.